it's Alice and welcome to our September wrap up. Um, I'll link our mid-month wrap up down below where we've already spoken about the first 10 books that we read in the month of September. So if you're interested in hearing my thoughts on A Dark Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab, 13 Stories by Jonathan Sims, I Arda by Julia Gray, Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, so well. Loveless by Alice Oseman, Potkin and Stubbs by Sophie Green, Brightly Burning by Alexa Don, The Dark Light by Julia Bell, Alex Approximately by Jem Bennett and You Say It First by Katie Catugno. Those will all be linked down below. So September was the month of book -opathon. Um, We ended up completely scrapping our TBR and deciding to do a new one. And so we were aiming originally when we did our rolls to be reading 8,206 pages, which was just ridiculous considering we only read like five and a half thousand last month. But we actually ended up on 6,545 pages, which means we managed 79% of the page count we were aiming for, even though we didn't read hardly any of the books that we actually were meant to be reading. Um, but I'm pretty proud of that. Um, pretty chuffed that we managed to get that many done. We also managed to read 19 books in total. So as I said, um, the 10 from the mid-month and then we managed to read 9 in the second half of the month. Uh, I'm kind of cheating on one of them because I finished it on the 2nd of October but I'm filming this on the 3rd and if I don't talk about it now I'm going to forget about it so we'll just squeeze that in there. But yeah, 19 books, not bad. Um, means that we were doing pretty much the same at the end of the month as we were at the beginning which is good. Um, and I'm going to share my thoughts on the 10 books that we read nine books that we read in the second half of the month with you now. Last time I started doing stats so I'll share those with you quickly as well. So in September we read two five star books, one 4.5 star book, six four star books, one 3.5 star book, six three star books and two one star books and one two and a half star book which I think I went straight from 3.5 to one and I can't remember now but I'm sure she'll be able to top this round in the right way. I'll get there, please. I'll get there at the stats. Um, so I'm pretty chuffed with that. Like we had, it was a very average reading month, like with six four stars and six three stars. But like it could have been worse. There are a couple of books that I popped up to four stars that probably should have been like three and a half. But I'm still not too used to doing the half star ratings. I've only done those over the last few months, but I've been getting a bit indecisive. So I will share my thoughts on the nine books that we read with you now um, and try and let you know what we rolled them for. Um, so the first book we read in the second half of the month was The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes and this wasn't actually one that we rolled for Book Oplathon, this was just one that we had to read for the blog tour post which I will also link down below. The Inheritance Games follows a girl called Avery Grams who is like a math whiz um, but she's from kind of like an underprivileged family like her mum has died her dad has like abandoned her so she lives with her half sister and her half sister's abusive boyfriend has kind of come back on the scene so she's moving out and going to live in her car when all of a sudden this guy turns up at her school and tells her that she is the recipient of part of his grandfather's um will so uh they can't do the will reading until she turns up and because he, she's getting something left to her and none of them have any idea what it is and she doesn't know their grandfather so she has no idea why she's been chosen um fast forward a few days and they do the will reading and it turns out that um the grandfather has kind of disowned his entire family um he's kind of taken their inheritance and given it to avery instead so she becomes like a billionaire and she has this massive mansion but she also has the mystery of like why did he pick her um because that he could have picked any other member of the Hawthorne family like he had two daughters they had like four grandsons um and like why would he choose a complete stranger over any of his own family um so I got like very truly devious by Maureen Johnson vibes from this because like the Hawthorne house that they're kind of it all takes part in is very similar to like the Ellingham Academy like you've got like the sprawling rooms the hidden passageways nobody really knows what what in there it's all very luxurious and decadent and opulent and you get a lot of the same kind of feeling in that the location becomes a character in its own right because you really do feel like the sprawling passageways have their own like personality which I always really appreciate I'm a huge fan of authors who bring so much character to their locations and Jennifer Lynn Barnes nails that in this one um, I also really enjoyed all of like the brain teasers. Um, I had some theories about where I thought it was going and then it didn't go that way, which was fun. Um, definitely kept me on the edge of my seat. Um, it's a bit of a slow starter, 
but I feel like once you get the ball rolling and once Ava has kind of been to the will reading and everything's kicked off, it's basically impossible to put this book down. I also loved the fact that all of the Hawthorne grandsons are really unique. So you've got like Nash, who's like the cowboy and he doesn't care about any of it. He's like, oh no, I'm happy not getting anything. I don't want to play grandfather's games. And there's Grayson, who was like the golden child, um, like the chosen one. And he was meant to be kind of getting everything and he thought he was going to be like the main heir. Um, and now he's kind of been shafted for Avery. And I loved the fact that the boys had such strong personalities because there's a real risk when you're writing four male characters of very similar ages from the same family that they could be very interchangeable. But um, again, Jen and Barnes absolutely smashes it. Um, I only gave The Inheritance Games four stars um, because there were a few bits that were a bit slow and I did find like there was a massive twist at the end which Sean saw coming within the first couple of chapters and seemed very predictable when you like looked at it on the face of things that was the only thing I wasn't a huge fan of but I'm really looking forward to reading the sequel on that one so the next book that we read in the second half of the month was A Spoonful of Murder by Robin Stevens and this was a book that we rolled for a book set in the past um so this is the seventh sixth seventh installment in the Murder Most Unlaid Like series and in this one we follow Daisy and Hazel as they go to Hong Kong um, following the death of Hazel's grandfather and we get to kind of experience a murder mystery in a different country where Hazel becomes like more of the focal character because it's her family and her home and she has her chance to properly step out of Daisy's shadow and shine. Um, I ended up dropping this one down from a five star to a four star because this was a reread for me and I found it difficult to get through this one first time around and I wasn't sure why. Um, I thought it was just because I just had a baby and I was very, very exhausted. So my brain wasn't really on it with the mystery kind of reading. But this time around, I think I love the setting and I love the atmosphere of Hong Kong that Robin Stevens crafts. But I feel like the mystery is just less compelling than the other ones in the series. And if I wasn't looking at it in comparison to the other books in the Murder Most Unlaid Like series, I probably would have still given it five stars. Like this is still impeccable and I love this as like a middle grade mystery it still shines but compared to like the standard of Robin Stevens other novels it just doesn't quite reach it especially because we then read Death in the Spotlight by Robin Stevens which is the next book in the Murder Most Unlaid Like series and this one is the best book that we've read in the entire series um so this one was a book that had LGBTQ plus rep um, and you have a few different LGBTQ characters in this story, so this is perfect for that. Um, and in this one, Hazel and Daisy kind of join a theatre troupe, and things go vastly awry when the lead actress is found dead. Um, I think this is the best book in the Murder Most Sunday Light -like series, and I think this makes me much more excited to read Top Marks of Murder and Desperate Sale, which are the last two books. This was my first time reading this one. All of the other Murder Most Sunday Light we've been reading recently has been rereads for me. But this was my first time reading this and I was absolutely blown away. I love the kind of exploration of the LGBTQ themes. Um, I think there's like a discussion between the two main characters in which one of them says that she likes girls and she is fine if the other character... The spoilers. It's not really a spoiler, but just in case you want to go into this one with like no no idea of what's going on but they have a conversation where she's like oh if you want to leave the detective society because of this that is not a problem with me like I'll understand and they have this discussion of like well, why would that make me leave it's a part of you it doesn't affect me at all like that is who you are and I'm supportive of that and I think especially as these are aimed at a middle grade audience and an audience who are growing with these characters they are going from like 12 up to I think we're reaching 16 towards the end of these books um and to be following the characters as you age and have these kinds of discussions is so empowering and I think Robin Stevens does such a wonderful job of making sure that middle grade readers will feel comfortable with their sexuality and won't feel ashamed and they won't feel like they need to hide who they are to impress their friends or to keep their friends because if your friend doesn't want you for who you are then they are not worth it. Um, I think the mystery aspect is brilliant. I saw what was coming about three pages before it all kicked off so I was on the edge of my seat, I had no idea what was happening and this is like one of the biggest books in the series, this is nearly 400 pages. We were planning on reading it over three days and we read it in just over one day, so we read the majority of it and then like the last part we finished the next morning. 
So this is one that you definitely need to set aside a large chunk of time to read because you will not want to put it down. And I cannot wait to carry on with the rest of the series. Death in the Spotlight was for the one of the books that we picked in a double roll. And the other one was that we rolled TBR Vet, for which we picked Skeleton Key by Anthony Horowitz. This is the third book in the Alex Rider series, which we have been reading over the last few months. And Sean and I both planned on reading these when we were in primary school, so it's a vet for both of us. Um, and we wanted to make sure that because it was a joint role, that it was a joint veteran. And this follows Alex Ryder as he has to go to Cuba to Skeleton Key and has to kind of infiltrate this place where they think that like a Russian guy has some nuclear bombs. Um, this one ended up being the two and a half star. And it's because I rated the rest of the Alex Ryder books so far three stars and this one was not as good as any of them. So I had to drop it down but I still didn't think it was bad enough to be a two star. Um, the star of Skeleton Key is the strongest Alex Ryder book so far. Um, you watch Alex as he like goes and does like ball boy duties at Wimbledon, which is really really interesting. And there's kind of like a mini subplot there when he like um, cracks a mystery that's going on at Wimbledon that nobody has any idea about. And that was really gripping, really enthralling. Um, first three or four chapters, really great. Um, and there's also a kind of a chapter when you're following the Russian guy as he is like accepting these bombs and like um doing bad stuff so you already know he's doing bad stuff because you follow his perspective at the beginning and then you go to alex but the pacing is really good on those it's just when they actually kind of go abroad that things just grind to a halt and i think these are very tropey books um when you read the first one you're like oh look the evil foreigner and like that's a massive trope and obviously these are like kind of semi-based in like james bond-esque um, and James Bond, it's normally like the, the foreign guy that's the villain. Um, and these were written in like the early 2000s. So they, you do feel the age in them. Um, but then by the time you get to book three and it's like, oh look, the Russian's evil. Uh, it just gets a bit exhausting because I just think it's very predictable. And I can imagine the Eagle Strike is going to be exactly the same. Uh, Alex Ryder has 90 minutes to save the world. He's probably saving it from an evil foreigner. He'll succeed because there's more books. But it, they're just getting a bit repetitive at the moment. Um, I'm glad that we only read the one. And I'm really glad that they're short because we can still read these in like a day even if they do get a bit draining. But definitely not one that I rated very highly. Um, but there was a really, really cool scene when Alex is like face to face with a shark. And he has to like face down with this like great white. And you think he's going to die and he doesn't die obviously because there's like thousands of more books. But the tension in that scene was impeccable. And if you just put Alex Ryder being like... Steve Irwin for a couple of chapters that would be really really fun to see him like up against nature like hand to hand with like a bear that would be really fun um but when it comes to him like facing down with the actual human characters it's just not interesting at all which is a massive shame but at least we've finally read it and we've nearly finished this chunky installment of like four um so we'll get that done at some point um the role after that was for the first book in a series for which we picked Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett. Um, we actually travelled all the way to Wampish to pick this one up because we don't have it on our local library and we couldn't get hold of a copy online and there were none in any of the ebook libraries that we have. So we made an Oxford Library card, travelled across the country. Um, and it was so worth it. Like this is probably the best book I've read this year. I'm gonna say that now and I don't think I'm gonna end up changing my mind because fuck me, this is bloody good. Um, like honestly there are no other words for how much I love this book uh, as you can tell I gave it five stars um, so in Foundry Side we follow a girl called Sanchia as she is on a quest to find a box which she has been paid to steal um, so you start off and it's a heist novel it's really high stakes you have no idea what this world is like but you're learning it as you go through it and you're learning more about like these um, scroll I can't scroll scroll why is my brain doing this? What are they called? Ah, <laughs> scra, scra, scrivings, isn't it? That's why it didn't sound right because it's scrivings, not scrivings. I mean, I still can't see it in the book, but that's fine. We'll go with scrivings. Um, so you're learning this world that's like surrounded by scrivings and the way that they kind of power the machines, and it's quite steampunk esque, but it's like an alternate universe, and. It throws you in the deep end, but it's so easy to get to grips with it. 
And when Sancha steals the box, she's like too intrigued. She's like, why am I being paid like thousands and thousands and thousands of whatever the money is to Davots? Davots, see, I can remember something about it. Oh, um, why am I being paid thousands of Davots to steal this box? And she breaks the rules of the contract and she opens the box. And inside is something called Clef, who is a talking key. And Clef and Sancha end up teaming up and there's so much going on that it's kind of hard to put your finger on it but you get like the ragtag bunch of like people coming together to like face down this evilness and it's like all the tropes but in such a unique way and the magic system is just so unique and i can't think of anything that's like this and the kind of dry humor is really reminiscent of ps brown and red rising is my favorite book series of all time so anything that reminds me of ps brown i'm right there for and this did that this did that so well and I absolutely loved it and I cannot wait to carry on with the sequel which is called Sure Fall and we also managed to get that out of the library at the same time so we'll be reading that within the next few days which I'm so excited about but then I don't know when the third one is coming out so we're going to have a bit of a wait on our hands but this is one of those books that I need to physically own and I need to reread and I cannot wait to re-immerse myself in this world and follow these characters through these adventures again and really kind of luxuriate in the description and the detailing because we we sped through this for a 500 page book I think we read it in either two or three days like it was just impossible to put down and I cannot wait to carry on with this series. The last book that Sean and I managed to complete for the Bookopolathon was a role for randomising our TBR for which we got The Boy from the Woods by Jen Minkman. Um, ended up rating this one three stars. It's an Australian folktale retelling so I didn't really know too much about the original story but I could see where it was going quite early on so there's like a big twist at the end which is like really emotional but because I could see what was going on it didn't quite get me in the feels but I can imagine if you didn't see it coming you would feel quite emotional and quite attached to these characters and you would get quite upset by the events. Um, this follows a girl called Julia who finds the guy who kind of humped and dumped her in the woods after a motorcycle accident and he can't remember anything apart from her name so she starts to think like oh maybe he means like maybe I mean more to him than he said I did and maybe he regrets his actions and so she like forgives him and they go like they kind of embark on this relationship but all of her friends and family know what he did to her so they're a bit judgmental about it and um, then her sister ends up getting some weird stuff going on with her um, trying not to give spoilers um, but then it's like it takes a turn that you don't see coming and it becomes really 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 interesting because you don't see it coming at all so there's like a subplot to the main plot which i did not expect um but yeah i thought based off of the cover and based off of the description i thought this was going to be cringy af and i thought that we were going to end up dnfing it so the fact that we ended up reading it in a day and really enjoyed it was a thoroughly surprising twist and i really enjoyed it oh pardon me um looking forward to carrying on with more of Jen Minkman's books in the future um she is self-published so I'm surprised that it was written as well as it was but like not only did it have like no overt like grammatical errors or anything like that which I find a lot in the self-published books that I read um it's one of my biggest bugbears so it was really a pleasant surprise but also there's some like brilliant turns of phrase and there's some very dry humor and there's like a lot of like, good kind of one-liners that are like really quippy um so if you're looking for something that's like a retelling of a bit of a more unusual tale, it's definitely one I would recommend. Um, Sean and I also rolled for a community shelf pick um, and it was to read a read then go book for which we picked Brazinga by Christy Paolini but we're still halfway through this one so I'll be talking about that in our October wrap up. Now for my books that I finished in the rest of the month, um, after I finished Brightly Burning by Alexa Dawn I rolled to read a Own Voices book and for that I picked And the Stars Were Brightly Burning Brightly. And the Stars Were Burning Brightly by Danielle Joando. Um, this is a book about a boy whose brother commits suicide and how he comes to terms with his loss and dealing with the grief and whether he gets revenge or whether he just kind of comes to terms with it um, but he wants to know why Al chose to do what he did and kind of who pushed him that far um, and at the same time we're also following a girl who was close friends with Al and we kind of see the two perspectives as they become friends and like connect because of their loss 
so we follow these two characters through like their grief and the reason this is own voices is because Danielle Joanzo was actually bullied to the point where she attempted suicide when she was in secondary school so she is drawing on her own experiences of her depression and her bullying to make this story more realistic and more emotionally evocative um I ended up giving it four stars because there's like a kind of twist like subplot-esque bit in it that just didn't feel very authentic um it didn't feel like it was genuine and I probably wouldn't have been that annoyed by it but the rest of the book felt so brilliantly genuine that you could believe that it was happening um you see kind of like the, the ways that grief affect people in different ways um the way that grief affects people of different ages so like their youngest sister um they hide from her how al died and she just thinks that he got ill um and so she deals with everything in a very different way compared to how his brother deals with it because he's the one who found al after he died by suicide um and i just think that all of those aspects are brilliant um the kind of bullying aspects especially the online bullying is very realistic the way that people can push it too far because they don't see that it's like a real person and the way that you can get involved with like a laugh even though you don't know that person you can still like dogpile on um that's all very realistic and i think that there's just this one aspect that kind of threw me out of the story a bit um i still find myself in tears by the time i finished it and i still think that this is one that i would definitely recommend and on according to goodreads there's going to be a sequel so i will definitely be picking that up because this was very impactful and it told a very important story and i think that it will cause people to reevaluate the way that they behave towards others um but then I think that it's one of those books that you wouldn't really pick it up if you were one of those people that acted that way. Um, so I seriously hope that at some point this comes on to like some kind of like recommended reading list for like schools or colleges because I think it's a very important subject to talk about and it's a very important topic to address with young people. But I think that the people who this could really impact and who would really benefit from reading this and would change their behaviour due to this story aren't the kind of ones that would pick it up which is the other thing I felt a bit kind of apprehensive about but I'm thoroughly impressed um I wasn't sure what to think of it because I'd kind of seen people saying like oh it's got a beautiful cover and it's like it's like a really important story but I hadn't heard anybody kind of dive into it in depth and I think if I'd heard one person actually kind of lay out what it was about I would have picked it up before um, because I have this on my neck galley and I've been staying on it for so long and I wish I hadn't slept on this one because I I want to be able to recommend this to more people because it is very very powerful um, so so read it because I'm recommending it to you now um, and I think it's a really important read um, I'll pause for a second the babies are currently playing drawing pads together um, which is impressive because neither of them can draw, they're both very small but they're having a whale of a time in the background so if you can just hear lots and lots of giggling that's because drawing pads are amazing um, but I'll carry on um, sorry if it puts you off because it's putting me off a little bit <laughs> he's so cute right um, The next role that I did for the Bacopolis on board was to read a book with Nietzsche on the cover and for this I picked The Names They Gave Us by Emery Lord which I also read via NetGalley and had in my TBR jar picks that I picked at the beginning of the month. Um, this follows a girl called Lucy whose mum has cancer and she finds out that her mum's cancer has come back on like prom night. Um, so Lucy is a pastor's daughter, she's never done anything wrong, she's always kind of played by the rules, she doesn't swear, she doesn't drink, she hasn't had premarital sex, she's waiting until marriage um but then when her mum's diagnosis is broken to her she kind of goes off the rails a little bit and um, it causes her devoutly religious boyfriend to break up with her so lucy is just looking forward to going off to church camp and being a counsellor and escaping from everything but her mum asks her to do her a favor and the favor is to go and be a counsellor at the neighboring camp daybreak who have had somebody kind of drop out at the last minute 
Um, so Lucy agrees because her mum has asked her to do it and she would do anything for her mum. And she goes to Daybreak, which is a camp for troubled teens, um, for people who have had losses, for people who have dealt with like gender identity issues, for people who have experienced teen pregnancy, um, drug abuse, like um, parents who've like abandoned them. There's so many different things that this camp addresses and Lucy is kind of thrown into this very unusual environment. She thinks it's like a hippie camp and she thinks she's going to hate it. But she ends up falling in love with one of the other camp counsellors called Henry because they bond over like their shared kind of religious beliefs and um, it helps her come to terms with how she's feeling about her mum and the questions that she's having with her faith and like what she wants to do with her future. Um, this is a book that I would have given five stars to if it hadn't been for the last three or four chapters. Because if you're looking at it as a story of Lucy dealing with her mum's diagnosis, coming to terms with it, learning about her faith and who she is as a person and can she really believe in a god who would let her mum be ill twice. Um, it's not even the first time her mum's had cancer, she's already come through it once and now this is like a recurring diagnosis. Um, and that story is very powerful, that story is very moving and inspiring and it really makes you think like if I was in that situation what would I do? how could I feel and so having Lucy's inner turmoil it's something that you can very easily relate to and Emery Lord writes that beautifully. Um, I can see why people recommend her writing and I'm very looking forward to reading some of her other novels because I own When We Collided and The Start of Me and You I think it's called yeah um, so I'm looking forward to giving both of those a try because I've heard so many amazing things about her and this one very much impressed me but I think she tried to do too much at the end of the novel so all of a sudden it starts trying to tell a different story and when you move away from the intimate scope of like Daybreak and the focus on Lucy and start bringing in these other aspects it just gets a bit cluttered. Um, the ending is very unsatisfying, it doesn't feel finished, it feels like somebody's literally just chopped the last three or four chapters out of the book and they're like oh yeah no um, we won't have this like wrap up because life doesn't have like a neat bow on it. But I feel like there is a way to make, to tell the story that you're telling and to close it off while still letting the world remain open rather than telling the story that you're telling, closing off, opening the world up again and then having that be the end of the book because you want to know what's going on with these characters, you want to know how the thing's going to play out, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of new kind of tension and a lot of new aspects introduced right at the end that you want to see play out because there are things that there that I have never seen explored in YA before um, and I would have really loved to have followed the story further um, I'm hoping that eventually Emery Lord might write a sequel to it because she's literally just released the sequel to The Start of Me and You and I've had that on my shelf for four or five years and the sequel came out earlier this year so it's not impossible that she'll suddenly release a sequel but as it is I've had to drop it down to four stars I was thinking of dropping it down to three and a half stars but because I really enjoyed the beginning so much and because there are so many scenes that I know are going to stick with me so many scenes that are going to pop into my head because they're so vibrantly written um, I've left it at four stars and that's why I feel I just do the review now because then I can't second guess it and I can't drop it down but ask me in a few months and it'll probably be a three. <laughs> um, and then the last book that I rolled for Bacopathon actually wasn't a Bacopathon roll um, so basically I cheated. Um, I rolled and I got a chance card and I picked out Night Blood by Ellie Blake and I was already halfway through a book called A Week by Natasha Preston and I thought mm, I'm already halfway through a week so I will stick with reading that, I'll finish that off and then I'll try and squeeze in Nightblood by the end of the month and as I said earlier A Week is the book that I finished on the 2nd of October so that obviously went well. A Week is trash, that is the easiest way to sum it up, it was a one star read, it was awful. Um, I read The Dark Light by Julia Bell earlier in the month and I had a lot of issues with it and A Week is very similar to that, there is insta love, there's like a religious cult who do terrible things um you have to suspend your beliefs so dramatically that it's just impossible like um these people our main character scarlet has been stolen from a cult who were going to sacrifice her on her soul's birthday her parents took her um she finds this out in the story um they took her and they moved across the country to escape from this cult but they didn't change their names they were jonathan and marissa and she was called scarlet and the little uh, her brother was called jeremy when they were in the cult and then they left and they're still Jonathan and Marissa with Scarlet and Jeremy. That's not realistic. And the whole premise of the plot hinges on the fact that Scarlet can't remember the first four years of her life. <gasps> she must have some dramatic memories. There must be like a hidden secret because she can't remember the first four years of her life. 
I ain't got a dramatic secret from when I was younger and I can't remember anything from the first four years of my life and I don't know about you but like I don't think it is that common that people can remember like oh yeah when I was like three and a half no like I might get like an odd flash of like oh yeah like me like w with my head like between my legs looking through dungarees I can remember like looking down the passageway when I had like my head I was like trying to do like a headstand or something it's the only memory I've got from before I was four that's not <laughs> that doesn't really reveal much about my childhood so I think the whole premise is so wild and then it's just awful like the, the insta love is so cringe and then the characters like so the first half of the book is her like oh no like my, my parents saved me from a cult and the second half of the book is I've been kidnapped to return to this cult and now I have to try and escape and the second half of the book could have easily been like 50 pages it drags so badly um I just wanted it to be over it was 300 pages it felt like about 3,000 um I should have DNF'd it but I am a stubborn bitch and I didn't want to DNF it so I carried on and I shouldn't have and I know that now and I'm gonna try to learn to DNF more um but it isn't like that the story is bad like the writing is awful the grammar was awful all of the characters are so bland and flat and boring like you genuinely it's like reading toilet paper there is no substance it just there's there's nothing of note it's just so forgettable and that's why i thought i would squeeze it into this because if i try and leave it until my october mid month i'll have forgotten everything about it already but like just don't read this book just don't i don't even know how it's got such a high rating on goodreads it's like three and a half stars or something there's so many people giving it five stars i'm like did you read a different book did it get republished and actually edited because this the copy that i read through net galley thank you net galley was not not at all so that is the other nine books that we managed to read in the month of september for the book -thon. um i hope that you enjoyed this video if you've read any of these books please leave your thoughts down in the comments um i hope that you love foundry side as much as i do i hope you love death in the spotlight as much as i do and i really hope that you haven't read awake because nobody needs to go through that nobody deserves that punishment um thank you for watching um if you'd like to like this video please do if you'd like to subscribe i would be very very grateful um i'll link my socials down in the description like always so if you want to follow me on twitter or hit me up on like my blog or anything then you're more than welcome to do that and we will see you soon with another video bye so um i'm doing a readathon called a coat along for the entirety of october november december january and february so if you'd like to join in with that you've got five months to get involved so hit me up over at a coat along on twitter and we will read it together um and i'll see you soon with another video Bye.